In 1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuler, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Schuler will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, and know that God's love for you reaches to the heavens. His faithfulness for you reaches to the sky. And no matter where you are in your life right now, God has plans to prosper you and plans to bring you hope in a future. Isn't that good news? Do you turn around and shake the hands of the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful that you've called us here. We believe that your Holy Spirit is present. We believe that you have a word for everyone in this church and everyone watching on television. We know, God, that nothing is happening by accident, that if we open our hearts, you can touch us in a deep and profound way. And so we're asking for that, trusting in that. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. for this morning's message, the words of our Lord. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. 
I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. May we be people who never lose our thirst and our longing for our God. My guest today is Dr. Dave Martin, and he's known by many around the world as America's number one uh, Christian success coach. His passion to teach others uh, how to walk in the fullness of God's plan by possessing and teaching the scriptural keys to biblical success. Would you please welcome with me Dr. Dave Martin? Thank you. Hi, thank Dave. You. Hey, thank you. So good to be here. Dave is an awesome guy. I, we had a chance to hang out in Houston. We actually met at Lakewood, and uh, it was just a... I, I just felt like we really hit it off. We've become good friends since yeah, and uh, met at different leadership things. But I just thought he's got an amazing story and uh, he's now touching so many lives. Let's just begin there. What, what do you do? Well, I, I try to help people. I, yeah. I try to what you just said at the very beginning. This is the day that the Lord has made, you know, let's celebrate. I'm just trying to get people to understand life is a gift yeah. and it's meant to be unwrapped. Gifts are meant to be unwrapped. I couldn't think of anything worse than getting a gift and not unwrapping it, you yeah. know. And every one of us, I mean, this gift called life, God picked it out just for you. He didn't, you know, it's like uh, he didn't go to Sam's or Costco, buy life in bulk. Yeah. You know, it's a gift just for, that's why none of us are alike. The other day someone told me, said, Dave, you know, you and me, we're just alike. I said, you know, if you and me are just alike, one of us is unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to have to go with you, you know. Yeah. Um, no, no I, I, I mean, I can't, I can't be Bobby. I've got to be me, you yeah. know, I can't be. 
uh, Joyce Meyer. I can't be Joel Osteen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Uh, I love that, but I can't be him. I've got to be who God created me to be. And so I'm just trying to p- help people unwrap that gift. You know, yeah. a couple of Christmases ago, I bought my mother-in-law a gift uh, for Christmas. I got her a cemetery plot. <laughs> and I had... Um, it's my, it's good. my mother-in-law. Anyway... Um, I didn't get her anything last year, you know, and she was mad at me, you know, you didn't give me anything for Christmas this year. I'm like, you didn't even use what I got you last year. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, yeah, when, I you, understand, when, yeah. when you get someone a gift, you yeah, want them yes, to use it, absolutely. you know, and so here's this gift called life. How do we unwrap it? How do we make the most out of life? Yeah, absolutely. because Because this is the day. This is all we got is today. So let's make the most of it. One of the ways Dave and I connected is, you know, he goes around just really encouraging people, motivating them to do the best with their life. And you do it through the lens of Christianity. You're not a pastor per se. I mean, although you've done a lot of pastoral things, you're, you're really trying to motivate and encourage people. And Dr. Schuler was a big influence on your a life. What huge you, influence on my life. This is where we sort of started yeah, connecting. Yeah, yeah. What a huge influence on my life. You know, I was, I was, this, was, this was 15 years ago. I said, one day. I'm going to be on the hour of power, you know, and, uh, and this is like a, a dream come true for me. I mean, this is yeah. something that, 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 well, what your, your grandfather taught, possibility thinking, you know, and seeing uh, through the eyes of faith, visualizing, seeing where you're going in the future. And that's, that's really how I ended up here today. You know, Dave, I feel like a lot of people today, a lot of, especially young people are very entitled. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people feeling like victims out there. There's, um, and it just seems like, um, a lot of times people are the opposite of, of motivating, right? Like people are yeah. getting really dark nowadays and really negative. Do you think that there's still, it seems like there, now more than ever there's a need for positive people. Oh, yeah, and it's, and it's work, you know, yeah. and it, it's teaching people. I say I, that again, I, it's work. It's work, it is. I was born a pessimist. Yeah. I wasn't born an optimist. Even my blood type is B negative. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, it's something you got to work on every yeah. single day. And, I, and a lot of times, you know, uh, people thought that scripture said, be transformed by the removal of your mind. But it actually, it says, <laughs> yeah. by the renewal of your mind. It's yeah. a change in the way we think. And that's what, that's what it is, possibility thinking. It's working continually on our thinking to see that with God, all things are possible. Yeah, that's right. And so God's really been, been using you and working through your ministry to touch, touch lives. And uh, you, uh, you just came, I know, from Hillsong. You're, you're really connected in all the many different aspects of the church. I mean, like, this is a different tradition than, say, Joel Osteen. But uh, I see you just meeting with lots of pastors. And yeah, well, you know, it's, it's fun. We're all, we're all going to the same place. You know, we just have yeah. some different methods and different ways of, of doing things while we're here. But, hey, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of just helping people, like you said, realize that this is the day. You know, it's yesterday's over, tomorrow's not here. All we've got is today. You know, one of the things my grandpa talked about a lot that I, I realized, like when he talks about being positive and being a possibility thinker, he was just he used to tell me, you know, Bobby, all I'm doing is taking this very, you know, weighty word faith that doesn't connect often with secular people yeah. and teaching him that faith is something for them today. And that's really what you're doing. You're teaching on faith. Yeah, yeah, you're, just to... To believe, like you said, believe all things are possible. I had a friend that said, I got a hold of that scripture, all things are possible. So I just decided I'm going to believe it. And if all things are possible, I'm not going to have any more colds. <laughs> and he said, nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to have a cold. 18 years went by. He didn't have a cold for 18 years. He, he went to Chicago to speak, and a lady picked him up at the airport, and she was coughing and sneezing. She goes, I'm sorry, I got a horrible cold. She said, I hope you don't catch it. He said, oh, don't worry, I won't. She said, what do you mean you won't? He said, I don't get colds. She said, what do you mean you don't get cold? She said, I just know two or three times a year I'm going to get a cold. You know, you get what you think, you get what you say, you get what you expect. He said, not me. About a week later, he was in Texas, felt his sinuses draining. He said, that's weird. Felt, feels like a cold. He said, I don't get colds. He said, I just prayed, uh, spoke to the germs of bacteria. He said, I don't get colds. You guys are in the wrong place. <laughs> he, said, he said, but I do know a lady in Chicago that's been expecting you, you know. Um, <laughs> And so it, it is. It's what you expect. It's what you're believing for. Yeah, you know? that's right. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about your, you just came from the Ultimate, or you were involved with the Ultimate Life Conference. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Ultimate Life Conference. a conference we do every year in Orlando for Christian business leaders yeah. just to come together. And the ultimate means the best. Life is a way of living. Yeah. So the ultimate life is the best way of living. And just trying to help people understand that there's principles. Here, here's a big thing. There's a difference between the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. 
The person of Jesus prepares us for heaven. The principles of Jesus prepare us for earth. Yeah. And there are ungodly men who will use godly principles to achieve ungodly results. While, while the church, we don't know the principles, we ignore the principles sometimes and wonder why we struggle. Yeah. And so in that conference, we just come bring people together for three days. We coach them and help them to live the ultimate life, the best way of living. And it doesn't mean things are going to be perfect. Yeah, of course. You know, we find that out. You've ever been on an airplane that hit turbulence, you know? What do you do? You know, people pray, they buckle up, but no one gets off the plane. <laughs> you know, they're not like, I'm out of here. This is too much, you know? And it's the same in life. Things get bumpy sometimes. I was on a flight the other day with a lady. She goes, I've never flown before. I said, it's okay. I'm on the plane. It'll be fine. She said, uh, we talked for a few minutes. I, I fell asleep, and, and we hit some turbulence. It started getting bumpy. She starts hitting me. She goes, hey, 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 wake up. I'm like, huh? huh. She's like, do something. <laughs> I was like, what do you want me to do? She goes, I don't know. Aren't you a preacher? I'm like, well, I'm kind of a preacher, but I'm not a pilot. You know? <laughs> She's like, I don't know. She goes, just do something religious. <laughs> and so I got up and took an offering. Is what I, I, I thought that was a good thing to do. You know? But... Uh, in life, you know, the, the Bible says you got trials, tribulations, you go through some things, but it says, be of good cheer. Yeah. Uh, that's what I love about your book, about happiness, you know, be yeah. of good cheer. God's already, he's already overcome the world. Proud that a power to harm you and have conquered it for you. That's good news right there. Well, Dave, you're changing lives. And I, I particularly love how you really speak to businessmen because you really see how Christianity and business intertwine. Yes. That's awesome. So you have a new book coming out called Another Shot. It Another comes out shot. in September. People can pre-order that. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about what that's well, about. You know, everyone's made mistakes. It's, it's a game plan for rebounding in life. Wait, just to clarify, you've made mistakes? I, one. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I overcame it. I wrote a whole book about that one mistake I yeah, made. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, but, People always ask me, why are you so into wisdom? And I'm like, I've made a lot of mistakes. That'll get you into to wisdom. And so it just takes, a, it's a plan for how to rebound, how to come back from setbacks in life, whether it's in business, whether it's in relationships, whatever it may be. We've all had some setbacks, some struggles. And through the book, I'm just trying to coach people that they can come back. It's not over uh, until he says it's over. Amen. And so how to come back and take another shot at life. Dave, you've got, you know, millions of people listening to you around the world. If you were to say one thing to this, you know, there's so many people that are listening, they're not religious or they're, they're having a rough time in life. What would you say to them? I just want you to know that the rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. And I'd get you to just keep saying that over and over because, as a matter of fact, just say it right now, right there. Say the rest of my life. The rest of my life. Will be the best of my life. Will be the best of my life. And, and keep saying it because what you continually hear, you'll eventually believe. If you've heard your whole life, you'll never make anything of yourself. You're dumb, whatever. You, you'll start believing those kind of things. But if you keep hearing the rest of your life will be the best of your life. Jesus came that we might have life. He didn't come that we might make a living. Yeah. He came that we might have life, have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Amen. Dave Martin, thank you so much for being oh, with thanks. us. Let's give him a hand. We're thank so you. glad that you're here. You God much. bless you. Safe into the 
Today, Pastor Bobby is thrilled to offer you a new book designed to deepen your spiritual walk and prayer life with Jesus. For your gift of $60, we will send you The Prayers of Jesus, Living in the Psalms, a workbook for growing closer to God through Scripture. Based on Pastor Bobby's new series on the Psalms, The Hour of Power has created a beautiful 5 by 7 workbook with instruction, Scripture, and room to journal your prayers. Order by July 31st and will include the CD Psalms as read by Dr. Robert H. Schuler. This CD contains 26 of the Holy Bible's most inspiring Psalms as read by Dr. Robert H. Schuler on the Hour of Power. Call, write, or go online today and request the prayers of Jesus living in the Psalms for $60 and will include the Psalms CD by Dr. Robert H. Schuler. Thank you and remember as always, God loves you and so do we.
Thank you, Luann, and the orchestra. That was wonderful. Brilliant. How are we doing? Good. All right. That's what I like to hear. Good morning. How are you? I just asked that. <laughs> how are you doing and how are you is the same question. We're so glad that you're here today. We believe that if you're the kind of person who says, I find myself thirsty for life, but I don't know how to be satiated, God has a word for you. Stay tuned. You know, if you're watching on television, we from the church just want to say thank you. We're honored that you're watching. And if you ever come down to Orange County, if you're near Disneyland or L.A., come worship with us. We're here at 930 and 1115 every Sunday. Also, you can follow me on Twitter, at Bobby Schuler, hashtag Hour of Power. Love it when you uh, tweet out anything from our program. And uh, I always respond to everyone at least once. All right, church, would you stand with me? We're going to say this confession together. Hold your hands out. Everybody's already doing it. I love it. Hold your hands out as a sign of receiving God's love. Say this with me. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I'm the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Amen. Maybe may be seated. So when I was in third grade, no, fifth grade, I uh, wanted a Sony Walkman. And the opportunity presented itself to me. There was this guy that came to our school who was essentially, you know, employing children to make money for his chocolate company. <laughs> and uh, he basically brought in this chocolate and he encouraged the students from our school to sell the chocolate in order to raise money to get prices. And as I realized later, I was drumming up like hundreds of dollars for this guy and for my school so I could get a $10 Walkman. <laughs> at any rate, it seemed totally worth it at the time. Maybe some of you feel that way in your jobs. Uh, anyway, so I had this box of chocolate, these mint chocolates, and I was walking around our neighborhood. It was hot outside. We lived in Chatsworth. Uh, and uh, super hot, and I'm walking around with my chocolates, selling chocolate. I'm way far from them, and I get super thirsty. And I just have nothing to drink. I'm so thirsty. I'm going door to door asking people to buy my chocolates to support my church. I get so thirsty, I get the dumb idea that maybe I should eat some of my chocolate. So I dig in, and I start eating chocolate, and it doesn't dissolve. It just turns into to brown gunk in my mouth, and now I've just gone from being thirsty to really suffering. So I'm walking around with like chocolate in my mouth, somebody knocks on the door and I go, hello, would you like to uh, buy some chocolate? There's sweat coming down my face, and I'll never forget this old lady, one time I knocked on the door, she must have seen it on my face, because she didn't even say anything, she left the door open, but she came back with a tall glass of ice water, with a little like bead of water coming down the side, you know, a little frost around the edges, and I just was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> drank the water, and I never forget, when you're that thirsty, nothing is as good as a tall drink of ice cold water. Can I get an amen, people? Amen. There is something about being thirsty and just drinking ice, better than lemonade, it's better than monster drink. And so today, I, I want to begin with that story because I want you to think of a time in which you were just so thirsty. You felt so thirsty, you would have done anything for a glass of water. That is the human condition. Our souls are thirsty. They're thirsty. They need to drink something. There's something in the heart of every human being that is thirsty, that wants to drink. You have a desire and you wonder, how can this ever be satiated? Today we're continuing a series on the Psalms. And the Psalms, today we're talking about the Psalms of longing. Psalms of longing are the Psalms in which David or one of the psalmists says, Lord, I long for you, I desire you, this, this reverberating from the heart that I want God, I need God. And yet an almost desperate heart that can't seem to attain or acquire God in its wanting. 
In Psalm chapter 63, which was read today, David says, You, God, are my God. Diligently I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you in a dry and parched land. You hear the thirst? There's just David's just complete desire is to, to want and to, to, to be with and to experience God to the fullest. David at this time when he's writing the psalm was being chased by his own son. He was king. He was an older guy now. He was well established. And his son Absalom decided he was going to take his father's throne, created an uprising. And now David is an exiled king in the desert of Judah. And this psalm comes out of him where it's like, it's all, you almost hear him just saying, I'm just sick of this. God, I just, I just want you. I just want you. I'm so sick of being thirsty and hungry all the time. Where are you? I need to drink of you. My whole body longs for you. I thirst for my God. As David speaks this way, it's like you almost hear resonating that like there are not enough crowns, there is not enough success in the world to satiate my desire for you, God. I need you, Lord. You feel it just coming through the psalm as he says, my whole body and my soul thirsts for you. It's the idea like when your mouth is filled with chocolate as you're selling chocolates in Chatsworth, you just would do anything for a glass of water, you know. Have you ever felt that way? Especially for you who are believers, you've been in the church a long time and you've been walking and following God diligently and you find yourself in a place where you're going through the rhythms, you do the same rote thing over and over and yet your thirst is not quenched and you say, God, where are you? I'm thirsty for you. Anyone feel that way? You just desire to be just plunged into God's presence and experience him like you used to. God has a word for you today if that's you. In Psalm 42, David echoes another psalm of longing as famous. As the deer pants for streams of water, so does my soul long for you. My soul thirsts for God. And this, this idea that, that the soul is just thirsty for God. And I just want to begin by this. No matter who you are, I know many watch on television, you say... I'm not religious at all. Many of you who are in the church are that way too. Your girlfriend dragged you here today and I barely have your attention. You're thinking, you know. Some of you are the same way too. You're different. You've grown up in a religious household and, and yet all people share the same thing. All of us are thirsty. And though not all of us know what we're thirsty for, all of us are thirsty for the same thing. We're thirsty for God. It's like every human heart is a vacuum Think of a vacuum cleaner. Like Think of the ones like when you go to the gas station with just that big nozzle and it's just, you know, like this is what very often the unsettled, hurried, desperate heart is like. It becomes like a vacuum cleaner. That no matter where you go, there is this giant sucking sound as you desire to draw just about anything into your life that will appease this thirst that you carry with you. Blaise Pascal recognized this. Many think of Blaise Pascal as a famous mathematician, but he was also a theologian. And he actually came to faith through math. Isn't that great? He decided that he was going to become a Christian because the math didn't work out the other way. It was a bizarre way of gambling, actually. It was called Pascal's Wager. And he decided, if I don't believe in God and I'm wrong, I'm in big trouble. But if I do believe in God, and I'm wrong, I'll never know. And so based on that bizarre rationale, he says, I guess I'll just believe in God because there's no risk in it, right? So he decides that through the mind of a gambler, that he's, the good bet is to believe and follow God. And so he comes to God in a way that's very intellectual. It's in his mind. And as he writes later, he says that he, he made sort of a mental decision to follow God, but nothing really changed in his life. And later he had a conversion from his head into his heart, where he truly experienced God, not because 
some rational thought, not because he worked the math out, but because something deep and relational happened between he and God. He went from learning about God to experiencing God. And man, let me tell you, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. And Pascal was famous for saying, all of us have within our hearts a hole that is in the shape of God. That only God fits in that hole, like an incomplete puzzle piece. The most beautiful part of the piece in the middle is missing, and God is that piece. Friends, some of you are searching your longing, and you don't know what you're looking for. You are thirsting for God, and he's waiting for you. If you would just have faith and reach out to him. St. Augustine, who was one of Pascal's biggest influencers, St. Augustine was from Africa, and uh, he also had this experience where he came to faith in the 5th century through his head, but not in his heart, and eventually had this incredible experience with God where he realized that something deeper had to happen. It couldn't just be in his head. He had to have a complete experience of God's love, life, and presence. And then he said these famous words, our hearts are restless till they rest in him. Our hearts are restless till they rest in him. Our hearts are thirsty till they drink of him. Our hearts are hungry till they eat of him. You will never stop searching until you find God. He is the final destination. And you look into other things for life. You look into other things to be satiated. You look into other things for peace. You will not find them until you find God. And when you find God and experience him to the fullest, your whole life will be transformed. But you can't just learn about God. You have to experience him. You can't just read about him. You have to be with him. You have to be baptized in his spirit. And until that happens, you will remain hungry and you will remain thirsty and you will remain restless. But God offers us true peace, true life. Too often when we have this uh, feeling of hunger and thirst in our life, we turn to other things, usually good things, and they become idols. And so we turn to things like even friendships become a way that we try and fill that void. And entertainment becomes a way that we fill that void. And shopping becomes a way we fill that void. Work becomes a way we fill that void. Very often it becomes substance. It becomes sex. It becomes other things that we think, if I get enough of this, we think someday if I get this thing, well then, then it'll be filled. It won't be. Not until you find And not just find, but experience God to the fullest. You know, being in a world like we're in, you have so much available to you. And yet that blessing can very often become your greatest curse. For those of us who are thirsty, very often it's like being on a survival boat in the middle of the ocean. You're surrounded by water. But if you drink any of it, you're going to be even more thirsty. You can't drink salt water. That's the maddening thing about being on a deserted island is you're surrounded by water and yet you can't find any real water to drink. If you drink salt water, you'll dehydrate faster and eventually you'll go crazy. Don't do it. Very much, very much of the time, we who are thirsty find ourselves like people in a life raft who are thirsty surrounded by water. Do you ever feel that way? And maybe you know, I can't drink it, but man, it looks good. When we reach out for these other things to satiate the hunger and the thirst that is the human condition, it's like scratching a mosquito bite. We all know you're not supposed to do it, but when you do it, man, it feels good, doesn't it? When you got that mosquito bite, you know, don't scratch it. It's like willpower. I will not scratch you. And then someday, you know, something happens, somebody hurts our feelings, like that's it. You know, and it blisters and it itches even more. And this is what the human condition is, isn't it? For you who are religious, this is a source of suffering. The fact that you want the things that you know you harm you. You want to go into credit card debt. You want to scream at somebody who cuts you off in traffic. You want to dive back into your addictions. 
right? You want to dive back into all of these things. You want to reach out to, to flood your life with friendships that normally that would be a good thing, but your friends become like an idol to you. You're trying to fill your void with even people. There are some of you who are even using religious tradition to fill the void, and it's still not enough. Even religion, even the Bible cannot, repl- and I hate saying it, but even the Bible cannot replace Truly experiencing God. Anything can become an idol if it is not God. And we need him in our life. Can I get an amen? Amen. Psalm 27 then. We ask the question, well, what do I do? I find myself thirsty. I find myself wanting to turn to these things. What do I do? Psalm 27 gives us the answer. It finishes with this word. Wait for the Lord. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Take heart. The first thing that we have to understand is when you are on the life raft, don't drink the salt water. Wait. Wait for fresh water. It's coming. Very often the process of waiting to experience God is the very thing that helps us grow as individuals. Living in the midst of the hunger and in the midst of the thirst very often is the thing that causes us to grow, to become the kind of people that can be world changers. Winter is an important part of the life of any plant. We don't like winter in America, do we? We want want summer and fall all the time. We want to be harvesting, harvesting, harvesting. We even do that to our food, and it's a sign of our spiritual place where we decide to use anything we can to make food big, plump, and, you know, harvest all the time. You know, for us, if you want to be healthy, winter... Winter is an important part of the life of every plant. It's that famous axiom that things don't grow on the mountaintop, right? They only grow in the valley. And very, very often the times when we're the most thirsty for God is the time when God is changing us and working in us uh, in, in some of the best ways. We oftentimes don't see it when we're there, but when we look back, we recognize God was doing a work in my life. Friends, if that's where you are, don't drink the salt water. Don't scratch a mosquito bite. Wait. Be patient. I am convinced that impatience is the greatest enemy to happiness in the modern world today. Nobody's willing to wait. Nobody's willing to be patient. Everybody's always in a hurry and you're never present. When you're with family on a beautiful night, you're thinking about work tomorrow. Be present with your family. When you're waiting on whatever it is, we're waiting, we have to move. We're waiting for, we want to move into a house. We want to hear back from it, you know? And I find myself like not being happy because I want to know about my house, right? And this is, this is me too. All of us, we live in this reality of constant hurry and impatience. We want to know what tomorrow holds, but when we arrive at tomorrow, we're we're looking to the next day. It's like um, there's this, deli we go to and there's a sign on the wall and it says free beer tomorrow (laughs) so every time you go in you know it just says free beer tomorrow (laughs) and that's how many of our lives are we're constantly living in in tomorrow we're impatient we get mad at God because he doesn't work like a microwave he's not a drive-through kind of God waiting waiting on the Lord is, and living in the thirst is an important part of growing as a disciple to Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? Sometimes, however, waiting on the Lord does become a rut. And I want to speak to that too. Because in that same line from Psalm 27, he says, wait on the Lord. But after that, he says, be strong, take heart. Be strong and take heart. Take heart means to be like courageous. Take heart means Do something brave. And for many of us, the valley, if you've been there a long time, some of you are saying, Bobby, I've been here a long time. Then I have a word for you. Don't wait anymore. (laughs) Stop waiting. For some of you who your valley has become a rut, it's probably because it's time to do something brave. It's time to, to do something courageous. Many of you have never shared your faith with anyone in your whole life. Many of you have never prayed with a stranger going through difficult times. Can I tell you something? 
as a believer, there are few things in this world that give me more life than seeing the light of the Holy Spirit come into somebody's eyes. If you want something to bring you out of a rut, share your faith with someone. You're like, oh, no, no, sir. Fine, enjoy the rut. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you that God teaches us, God nurtures us so that we are trained to be world changers. Being a world changer is not comfortable. The Great Commission is not easy. It's a scary thing. Jesus tells his disciples, leave your home, leave your stuff, and go to a distant land. It's going to be very dangerous. You live in a world in which you can be murdered, robbed, and I just want you to go, and I want you to die as a martyr and share your faith. If the first thing you're thinking about when it comes to sharing your faith or praying with a stranger or something like that, if you think to yourself, that would be socially awkward, you're the perfect person to do it because you understand social norms. You'll do it the right way. In fact, the guy that probably doesn't need to do it is like, heck yeah, I'm going out there, I'll pray for everybody, I'm gonna witness to everyone. That's the guy that you're like, just, you know what, go on retreat and just chill out for a while. <laughs> it's the person who's like, that's really scary, I don't know what I would say, that would be weird. You're gonna be the right person because you, under you understand social norms, but it takes, it still takes courage but you'll do it the right way. I know, because ever since I sent out the invitation, next time somebody says they're doing okay, you ask them what's wrong, they tell you what's wrong, you say, can I pray for you? I've had like four of you tell me that you actually did it, I'm proud of you, good job, and all of them were awesome stories. And you know, all four of those people, it was really hard to say, can I pray for you? Like it was like really hard to say that, right? But friends, we ha if you are in a rut, if you have been in an eternal winter, it's, it's time to do something brave for God. And, and I, I don't mean like, you know, jump off a cl cliff or something. That's brave for you. You know, I mean, share your faith with someone. I mean, uh, offer to pray with someone who's suffering. I mean, to give a gift to a neighbor or, or someone who is in need that is that's a scary amount. I mean, doing something that is a big risk and it's not for you, it's for God. I remember um, when I was in high school and I decided after leading the first person ever to faith that it was like an addiction, like telling people about Jesus. It brought me so much life. The thing that was amazing about it was I first started with the sort of like, you know, somewhat popular kids in the school, you know, the, and the nice kids and they just were not interested in my religion. But when I talked to a heroin addict at her school who was in the occult. She loved what I was talking about. And then I realized God's called me to witness to the bad kids. I'm still doing that, by the way. That's you guys. That's you guys. And I remember like one of the first guys that was really following me was the drug dealer in our school. And he didn't quit dealing drugs when he started following me. He was following me around and talked to me about the Bible. And he's like, hang on one second, I gotta make a deal. I'll be right back. And you come, you come back. I just kind of lived in that, you know. But I found, I found that when I went to college and I stopped being around the bad kids and I stopped witnessing and sharing my faith that I entered into a winter in my life. Very often, the only way you're going to get out of your rut is if you act in faith and do something brave for God. Do something brave for God today. Do it right now. Do, do something brave for the Lord and you will drink of his water again. God honors those who take faith and trust in him and not in themselves. He, he blesses them with his spirit. He blesses them with favor and with his power because they're doing his work. Do something brave for the Lord today. Can I get an amen? I was finished with the last story. So I was living at my house on Palm Street. I had these two guys that would come to the door. Let's call them Elder Smith and Elder Johnson. And that was the funny thing. They never told me their first names. I even asked them, I was like, what's your first name? You're 18 and you have zits on your face. I'm not going to call you Elder Johnson. He's like, well, you can just call me Elder. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Elder Johnson. You know, didn't mean to hurt your feelings. So these two guys would come to my door and they would say, hi, we're from the Church of Latter-day Saints. We want to share our faith with you. And I, would, and I would say, oh, that's it. And I always told the same joke. Can I get you a cup of coffee, a beer, a glass of wine? 
because they would sit down. It was every time. And so we would sit and we would talk for like an hour and a half. These guys, they just linger, you know. They came in like the short sleeve, button up shirt with the name tag and the little helmet and everything. And we would sit and talk. And this started happening, Hannah, like what, once or twice a week almost. These guys had just begun their two-year missionary trip to California. One of them came from Ohio and I think the other one came from, I don't know, Cincinnati or, or Chicago or something. Anyway, so they would come and they would sit. And over two years, the three of us became very good friends. And we would debate Mormon theology versus Christian theology back and forth. And we'd, we'd get into all of this stuff. And, and I'd always make the same joke. Can I get you a glass of tea, a cup of coffee, a beer, a glass of wine, something like that? Water's fine, thank you. <laughs> and uh, by the end of their, their thing, we'd become dear friends. It was two, two years. And we sat down and I said, so, I just have to know. It, what was weird is I started giving them advice on how to convert people better. I know it's like, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I was like, you know, we're... Wear long white sleeve shirts and then like roll it up. It looks cooler and get like a skater helmet. Don't wear this. <laughs> so at the end I said, guys, I, I'm just curious. How many people did you, did you baptize or convert on your two-year mission? They looked at each other and they said, no one. <laughs> so not one person converted in your two-year mission. They said, no. I said, well, what, what did you do? I said, well, we basically went door to door and it was really hard. They said people would sick their dogs on them. They said people would slam the door in their face. They said people that claimed to be Christians would cuss them out. They said one guy arrived at the door with a gun. And they said when we're having a really, really rough day, we'd look at each other and we'd say, let's go to Pastor Bobby's house. <laughs> and they would come and they would sit with me for a couple hours and time would go by and I'd like try and encourage them to go to the next house, you know. But they would come to me for encouragement, which was, which was really neat, because even though I know they're Mormon and everything, there's something that made me feel good, first of all, that, that they were touched. But this is the thing that I wanted to point out. The question in my mind was, why would the LDS church send their kids on missionary trips? Why would they do that if nobody's converting to faith? You know why? Because they're building the missionaries themselves. Because those two guys through all of that difficulty, it's scary when somebody pulls a gun on you for sharing your faith to get up the next morning and knock on another door. Let me tell you something. Whether they're right or wrong, they had a conviction for faith. Why? Because they were doing something brave. If you find yourself in a rut, do something brave for God, or stay in your rut. Do something brave for God, or stay in your rut. Do something brave for God, or stay in your rut forever. Because if you don't do something today, you'll never do it. Am I right? Doing something brave for God. Doing something brave for God brings life to us. So some of you, especially if you're in ministry, you need to stop and wait. You know who you are. Some of us, we need to wait. We need to live in the thirst. But if you've been thirsty for a long time, it's time to activate the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to invite everyone who's in this church today and everyone watching on television, if you want to know the Lord, to pray this prayer with me. And even if you're already a believer, pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, I am thirsty for you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your student. Give me your Holy Spirit. And teach me what it means to, to live your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for being here today. We're so glad. Can we give a hand to Dr. Dave Martin and just thank him again for being here? Super encouraging day. Once you know, you're always welcome to come to 1115 Contemporary Service. That's after this. Uh, everybody's welcome. And if you're from out of town and you want to talk, I'm always at the end of that service available to talk and hang out. I hope that you were encouraged when you came today. 
And, and I hope you leave here finding a way to satiate your thirst for God, that, that you recognize truly that God's life is available to you. It's, it's out there, out those doors, as soon as you go, that you can drink of the living water of Jesus. That's truly my prayer for you today. And so now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord give you his peace in your coming in and your going out, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you come to stand before Jesus on that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. Today, Pastor Bobby is thrilled to offer you a new book designed to deepen your spiritual walk and prayer life with Jesus. For your gift of $60, we will send you The Prayers of Jesus, Living in the Psalms, a workbook for growing closer to God through Scripture. Based on Pastor Bobby's new series on the Psalms, The Hour of Power has created a beautiful 5 by 7 workbook with instruction, scripture, and room to journal your prayers. Order by July 31st and will include the CD Psalms as read by Dr. Robert H. Schuler. This CD contains 26 of the Holy Bible's most inspiring Psalms as read by Dr. Robert H. Schuler on the Hour of Power. Call, write, or go online today and request The Prayers of Jesus, Living in the Psalms, for $60. And we'll include the Psalms CD by Dr. Robert H. Schuler. Thank you. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And when you visit our website, you'll discover books, devotionals, and other resources to take your Christian life to a new level. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. And when you do, consider supporting this incredible ministry on a regular monthly basis. We're taking a life-changing message literally around the world. And your regular financial support makes all the difference. Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future.